parties, uh, you know, uh, uh, sporting activities and so on. So that kept them busy. And uh, they never thought so much about the living condition as such. Your political initiation or political activism, was it in any way formed by being born and living in magazine barracks? Uh, to an extent, yes. When I was at magazine barracks, um, we had a, a group of youngsters who were always together and uh, we formed what we call a, a, a rose club, you know. Uh, it was a communist party uh, club mm -hmm. uh, among all our you know, comrades here. And uh, we used to uh, use that platform to explain the conditions that were prevailed in the, the, in the magazine barracks. And when you were forced to leave, what was that like? When, I, when the family was forced to leave magazine barracks, what was that like? Well, you see, at that stage, <clears throat> uh, I may say that my father passed on in 1934. And uh, the bylaws of the uh, municipality was, if the breadwinner passes on, uh, one of the family members must take up the job so that we can continue living <clears throat> in, the, in that uh, magazine barracks. But unfortunately, we had none in our family who were able to take up the job that after my father's death. And we were forced to leave Bagsit Barracks. And uh, we went to live in a place called Depot Barracks in Point. My father, my brother was employed at the hospital as an orderly. And did it change <clears throat> those relationships that you had developed over the years? Uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, contact with the people in Barracks. For instance, my sister, who was buried at that state, lived in Barracks. Mm -hmm. We used to visit her quite often too. What would you say to a young person who asked today, why should they remember magazine Barracks? What was so special about this area? Well, we, let me put it this way, we loved living in Magazine Barracks in spite of all the conditions that prevailed. And we were free to decide what we wanted to do. And nobody, you know, objected us and going out of way and so on. But in spite of uh, the facilities not being conducive to living conditions, but we were quite happy living in Magazine Barracks. Oh, that's absolutely beautiful, Mr. Gandhan. Thank you for sharing that personal story with us. <coughs> Kiru, such a beautiful memory and such beautiful stories, but why aren't these well documented? Well, that's the major challenge, and the challenge is one that rests with us because it's not going to be a case that the government or somebody mm -hmm. in a university is going to go out and research this. But while Mr. Gandhan raised that fascinating insight that takes him back over 70 years of the red, red rose social club. And what from this book, uh, The Lotus Blooms on the Eastern Flay, which was written by uh, Mrs. Pushpam Murugan. And this is a seminal work on the history of that uh, barracks and that community. So as he's pointed out, in spite of all the challenges there, they welded a community together. When they look back on it, the people I interview look back on the magazine barracks with great warmth in spite of what they face. And here in this book, Mrs. Murugan talks about the Red Rose Social Club. <laughs> and she says, the name indicates communistic awareness. These members also met at the bachelor's cottage and they named the area Stalingrad. A son born to one of the members was named <laughs> Stalin. The Young Communist League was organized in magazine barracks the Guardian, that's a newspaper, was distributed by the members and the clubhouse was a centre where members met to play darts, cards, carom board, that's something we forget about, <laughs> carom board, yeah? and, and play music. And there's a lovely picture here of the members of the Red Rose. So uh, Mr. Garnon stopped short of telling you that he, he joined the Communist Party through the Red Rose Social Club before he joined the Natal Indian Communist Congress and before he got involved in activities of the African National Congress. So 
it tells you about how being workers, they were very concerned about the rights of workers. And his brother, R.K. Gowden, was the president of Dimes, the Durban Indian Municipal Employees Society, for 25 years. And he was one of the major influences, not just on him, but a whole generation of political and trade union leaders as well. A fascinating history, and we're going through that this evening on Walk the Talk. It's approaching half past seven. Remember Remember, you can call 089 or WhatsApp any questions you may have on 071-613-7803. Diresh is standing by to take your calls. Kiro, I want to go to a message on the WhatsApp line. It's from Basant, and he says, very interesting topic. How or why did the name Magazine Barracks originate? Right, that's the stuff of uh legend also because in the course of my own research and my family comes from magazine barracks although i was born in in chatsworth the the name comes from a military depot that stored magazine magazine rounds magazine powder and so on so this comes from the the military history of that area around ordnance road uh, a piece of <coughs> land was given to the military for these purposes and later on that area um, came to be known as Magazine Barracks. Now, if you ask around, people have told me all kinds of stories, everything from people taking pictures or papers out of magazines to line their shelves and, and cover their tables and things like that. So there's a whole range of stories that go with it, including one that said these were military barracks into which the Indian workers moved. But I've gone through the minute, minutes of the, of the council at the time, and essentially it was about developing barracks for workers who were coming in. And it wasn't only in South Africa that they built barracks. Mm -hmm. They built them in Rhodesia, in Guyana, in Fiji, in West Africa. And the design is pretty much the same all over the world. So it's maybe some architect sitting in London drawing these plans for colonial control in the middle of the world. One feature, the Kongela barracks, which still remain, are pretty much the same design as the larger part of magazine barracks was. But there were different sections. My granny, for instance, lived in the tin barracks. The later uh, uh, sort of brick cottages that were built had running water and things and looked like much nicer structures. But that was the diversity of the accommodation the municipal workers for the corporation had. So tell us then about your family history, your personal ties with magazine barracks. Well, my grandfather was a worker for the corporation. And on that account, he was uh, given accommodation there. So as Mr. Gounden pointed out, if you worked for the municipality, then you were given accommodation. There. And it wasn't any benevolence on the part of the council that they gave you accommodation. They wanted workers nearby to their places of work so they could be on time and that they could have a controlled and settled labor force. So if, you know, you didn't wake up and come to work in the morning, there was somebody to check on you. So you couldn't be cutting work. So if you live far away and you called in sick and things like that, that didn't allow um, to happen in, in the magazine barracks itself. So that's an aspect of the history I've been picking up from the trade union records because Dimes, which really was a uh, the forefront of trade union activism in South Africa. And we're talking about right across communities, white colored Indian uh, and African trade unions. Dimes was a leading force. So Dimes today is now um, morphed into the South African Municipal Workers Union. So it, it bequeathed a very powerful heritage. And R.K. Gowden was one of the people we must credit for creating trade unionism in the country. And it also 